Hey, my guest this morning is Christiane Lemieux, author of the new book, Frictionless. <laughs> my new book. Before we talk about the book, which is really great reading and really insightful, um, and I really want to talk about the necessity of delusion when we get to that part. Okay. But before we do, I want to talk about your background. Um, Zoom backdrops have become the new personal expressions, and, and you've kind of created these. Tell me a little bit about them. So we are doing a design presentation for a large um, retail, uh, a large retail company in the United States that focuses on furniture. Um, and this was one of the trend boards around um, the neo preppy trend we're starting to see. And when I jumped on this morning, it was still back there from my last presentation. So I just left it for you. There we go. <laughs> because it's, it's sort of entertaining, but yes, it's very specific to a, a specific um, home furnishings sp upholstery trend right now. Ah, interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. All right, we're gonna have to circle back to that. Now, okay. um, we're going to include this on our On The Record podcast. So I have to tell you, you are the first returning guest on On The Record. The well, I feel, I, anything with, with you, Bill, I feel, I feel very honored. Thank you. Well, I, I feel the same way. Um, but really what, what kicked this off is the new book that you wrote, Frictionless, mm -hmm. the future of everything will be fast, fluid, and made just for you. And, yes. and this is literally hot off the press. Yes. Speaking, this is just starting to roll out. What? No, actually, you got, the fir you got one of the first advanced copies. So it goes on sale June 23rd. Look so, at that. 20 days. All right. So, tell me a little bit about you. In the book, you write about the title did not, you didn't start with the title. It, start, it came from kind of organically out of the interview process. And, yes. and you interviewed, it looks like about 30 different people for this. We interviewed 60 and cut it to 30. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So, tell me about how the title emerged from those discussions and explain to people what frictionless means. Sure. So let me, let me tell you, there's a story behind the story. Um, and it's that I started my first home furnishings business out of a uh, university, a college, as you guys in America call it, out of college, out of Parsons School of Design um, in, in 1999. Um, I mean, like right out of college. Um, and I grew it, it was, it was, it's called Dwell Studio, and I grew it over about 13 years, and I sold it to Wayfair in um, August of 2013. And what I realized as I, was, as I was starting to write all of this down is that had I written a business book then, it would have been worth nothing but you know, a door jam or kindling for your fire, because every single thing had changed. Um, and when I went to, to, to Wayfair, um, I was immersed in, in you know, the, the, the future of business. I mean, to, to and, and I say this with like so much respect, to say that Neeraj is an incredible e-commerce CEO is an understatement. And what I learned when I was there was, I mean, what the, what the future of everything was gonna look like. Um, and, I, and I think it's not only Wayfair, but every single thing we experience. And when you think about, um, especially in the last nine weeks, we have all become, you know, digital human beings. Even if you were the holdout before this, who said, I'm never going to, you know, buy groceries in line, or I'm never going to have my pharmacy delivered to me online, or all of these things, you were, you were actually, you know, it, for the first time in your life, immersed in it because out of necessity. And so I think everybody can understand the concept of frictionless now. It was, it, was sort of a, it was sort of interesting before, and now it's part of our lives as we're all digital first um, you know, citizens. And what it, what it means is the companies that create the best experiences for us. So you know, whether it's, I think Amazon is probably you know, the, the summit of frictionlessness, right? Between the wallet, and the prime and the two day shipping and the endless SKUs and giving us everything we want at the click of a button, they change the way we interact with retail. And you will realize whether it's your favorite airline or your favorite hotel booking site or wherever, the one that is easiest for you, the one that is the most frictionless for you is the one you're going to go back to over and over and over again. And it's competitors that don't do the same thing will lose. And so what I am, you know, what I am trying to, to show every business, big or small, is that it's really up to you 
to create the most frictionless experience for your consumer so that you have a chance to win. And that's really what the book is all about. Now, as you explain it in the book, uh, and you, you talk about it both in terms of a business, but also in terms of employees and yeah. the needs of millennials, right? And it, it really seems to be very much the way you describe it is about giving people back time. Giving people back really, time, exactly. The essence of being frictionless is that people want time, they value time more than money in some cases. And so all of these people that you interviewed, all of the businesses that you talked about have found ways to exchange time and giving people time for service. getting your money. So you're right. So you, you, have, you, have, you have read the book and you've circled into the, 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 I think the most important thing about the 21st century is that as a human species, we have all realized that there's only one, one and only one non-renewable resource, right? And that's time. I mean, you know, that's in our lives that we can control. We can't get the time back. Um, and opportunity cost is opportunity cost, right? So if you can deal, like I think about, I fly on airlines all the time. And I think about, um, there's one that I use on a near constant basis because their interface is so good that I can get on, book my ticket, get to Charlotte, get back in 30 seconds. I don't have to deal with any of it. And, you know, truthfully, that is the difference between a very loyal customer like myself and somebody who's, you know, looking for the, the shopping for the best price. At the end of the day, like I value that the opportunity cost for me not having to look at 40 sites and just getting it done because I'm saving myself, myself hours there. And so it really is about time and it's about time structurally, but it's also to your point, I mean, I've thought about this a lot in the, in the last nine weeks because you think about your employees, you think about Zoom, you think about the interfaces that have made this frictionless. And you know, my winner in all of this, and I'll say this on the record, is Slack, right? Because Slack has made, Slack and actually Zoom, Slack and Zoom have made, um, you know, dispersed uh, companies work. And so they are frictionless. They are beautifully made. They are easy to use. They are intuitive. We can all go back and do them. You know, like my, my 70, whatever, three-year-old mom, um, you know, called me up and said, Christiane, have you seen this thing Zoom? I was like, oh my God, mom. <laughs> all right. Like, but welcome. Welcome to the 21st century. You know, and she realized she could watch the BBC on her phone. And that was like a revelation to her. But I'm, I'm, I'm excited for her because now she gets to, you know, she gets to do things she never thought she could and she gets to do them frictionlessly. And so that is, that is, we have to think about that. that I mean, that, that, that to me is the business of the future. Now, the other element that seems to come into play, and you talked about the evolution from Dwell Studio to your current business, is, I don't want to call it assetless, but it's removing a lot of the stuff, yes. right? So yeah. when you moved your business, you were able to do that much more quickly because yeah. your, your business is now cloud-based. Yeah. There's no inventory. Talk nope. a little bit about um, how this conversion has taken place from, from all of these things that are built on physical assets and how the change in the internet has kind of made, and I don't want to call it assetless. I mean, that's not the right word, but it's stuffless, right? Stuff I mean, yes. So stuffless, so stuffless is a really important thing, right? And I, I, I will circle back to good old Neerd Shaw taught me about stuffless. Um, and he taught me about, you know, he taught me about the cost of stuff. But somebody's got to make stuff. So we, we can circle back to that. Like there, there's ways to do this really beautifully. So when I think about my first business, you know, I, it cost me like, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand dollars to build the website. I had a closet full of servers. Um, everybody had a desk phone. Um, and you know, two iterations later, everything is based in the cloud. There is no server room. We don't have actual office phones. We have our computers, our cell phones, and that's it. Um, we were able to close our office in New York city, get out of the lease. So my first business, you know, had all of these, all of these infrastructure, we had a store. We had, you know, catalogs, we had inventory, we had telephones, servers, you know, uh, and, and landlines, like all of these things that kept us in place. And during the, you know, the COVID pandemic in New York, we were literally able to get up 
from our desks, walk out the door, lock it, return the key to our shared workspace and work from home. And it literally was seamless. And this is the second time I've done this in New York, moving from one co-working space to the next with, with, not, with nothing, with, with our entire business being built in the cloud. Um, so I will, I will circle back to the, I will circle back to the inventory, the inventory of it all. So the inside was based on this philosophy of mine that, um, our industry is not easy, right? It's not, it's not easy. You can't just walk in and do this. It's hard to make furniture. It's hard to make consumers happy. It's hard to give them the tools to create the, you know, this, this beautiful atmosphere that is their life. Um, and I did it once and I did it with, you know, with a store and inventory and a large staff and the server room and the telephone lines and all of those things. And then when I got to the fork in the road, like the, the sort of uh, entrepreneurial fork in the road, I looked at the business I built and I looked at where I thought the future was going. And I thought to myself, okay, for the first time in my life, I'm going to actually have to raise money to, to, to expand this business. And I'm going to have to raise money for stores for more inventory for all these things and it doesn't make sense to me so this is like this is i'm giving you the real story here here bill so i hired an investment bank in new york city and i said to them here are the 15 people that i would sell this business to who will be able to take it and go to the next place with it right in ways that structurally don't involve me raising money into a business model that i think is actually diminishing um because I'm also Canadian and Canadians can't raise money and, and then not deliver on it. So they just can't like, that's just, this, that's like, a, that's like a cultural thing. So I, I, you know, I, I saw all of the usual suspects. I spent time with, you know, the greatest CEOs in their business. And then I walked into Boston and I, and I looked around and I was like, wow, like what is going on here? And, you know, I saw the engineers and you know the overpack centers and the logistics and all of the things that Wayfair had down, and I realized that they were they were they were the, the our business of the future, um, and it was you know pr pretty frictionless and you know it was one category that they really they they they've done a beautiful job, and so um, you know I I sold the business to Nierge and I went to to onto the executive team at Wayfair and to say that I sat there like a sponge and just I learned I learned um, and there are some there are some really important underlying you know ideas and it, not carrying inventory just from a business perspective is a huge thing and so I thought to myself if I could start a design business that had no inventory well that's a business that I would start I would do this I would take this crazy journey in our industry one more time and so I left Wayfair in 2016 and it took me almost a year and a half to put together, you know, in my, in my tiny office here in New York to put together the, the, the back end supply chain to do this. And it required me learning about machinery and like all of these, all of like just educating myself. Um, and we, then we did it. And then, you know, launched out of beta in August of um, 18. And so no inventory, exclusive product, made on demand, like all of the things, you know, that I think are fundamental to what our industry is going to look like 2.0. And, you know, listen, here's the thing. North Carolina is already doing it. They just didn't get credit, right? They're bench making things one at a time. Like I think about Klausner every day and like what an extraordinary job those guys do at, a, at an affordable price point with really beautiful quality, one after the other. And they just weren't getting credit for it. So let's talk about the inside and how that model now works. Yes. Because on paper and to discuss it, it sounds like, gee whiz, that all happened so fast. You can pick whatever you want, you can custom make, but to make all of that happen in a time frame, and here it comes back to, right, frictionless in terms of time. Yes. Yes. You have to be able to deliver in a time frame that the consumer yes. wants. Yes. And you've also taken out a lot of costs, which allows yes. you to make it affordable to the customer. You got it. What went through all of that process? I mean, how does that go from conception to the consumer's home and all of those steps. And and then you're talking about customization, right? You're not talking about, I'm yeah. churning out, you yeah. know, model yeah. T's in yeah. any color you want, as long as it's black. You're yeah. talking about choice. Yeah, well, let, let's, let, I'm talking about celebrating the industry that we're in, right? 
And so when you think about, you know, the political landscape now, right now and all the things that got offshore, okay, furniture did not get offshore. And the interesting thing is I sat at Wayfair and looked at the back end and saw all of these amazing American companies that could deliver furniture in under four weeks, custom furniture built from the ground up. And I was like, wait a second, there's something here. Like there's something here. So, you know, this is the thought process. So I'm, I'm seeing this. And so, you know, it is the, the Klosters and all these other people of the world that are, you know, have been amazing partners of mine, both at Dwell Studio all the way through Wayfair, right? And then I'm looking at what I've learned from, you know, m my years of upholstery partnership with somebody like Robert Allen, right? And so I'm thinking to myself, wow, if I could do the upholstery on demand and the furniture on demand and just make the thing and get it out, then there's no waste nobody's holding inventory. People are getting exactly what they want. Can I figure this out? And I did. And like I spent, I've been, you know, I, I was in Italy in digital printing manufacturing plants, trying to figure out which one was the best that would give interior designers the fabric that they would love. So it had to be printed on linen or linen cotton or all of these things because I had the data from years of sell through, right? Like I knew from Robert Allen from Dwell Studio what sold. And so I, it's like a puzzle that I was just putting this piece, these pieces of the puzzle back together. But in the back of my mind, I hear Neeraj saying, t telling me what a beautiful business model is and telling me to think about every single one of these decisions with a return on investment in mind. And so here we are. I, I wanna talk a little bit about um, that idea, right? That, that customization, um, and then building that to the consumer. And I want to talk about overcoming obstacles. One of the people that you talked to in the book was David Greenberg. Yes. And I, there was an interesting passage where you described him as a kindred spirit. And I want to, I want to just read for folks who maybe haven't seen this. Um, some, he said, you describe him as someone who's very stubborn. Right? In other aspects of life, being stubborn might not be such a great thing, but for an entrepreneur, it's great. You just keep pushing through and block out the sound of this isn't working. Mm -hmm. There's the other voice inside you that's saying irrationally, no, 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 it's going to work. Yes. And he said, at this point, you realize that he and you, you and he were kindred spirits, yes. the delusion of optimism. The delusion of optimism, yes. Well, if you know me well, <laughs> you will know that that is probably one of my most profound characteristics is that um, when I believe in something and when I believe in people, like when I, when I think about the, my partners in this who manufacture this furniture day in and day out, when I believe in people, I, I'm, I'm all in. Um, maybe to the point, um, maybe the, to the point of delusion. But what, what David did is he changed that whole moving experience, that hideous moving experience for everybody. I mean, Updater is a pretty phenomenal, I think they just raised some kind of crazy round. It is a phenomenal business. And it takes the friction out of the most heinous things we have to go through every time we move. And it's a one click solution. And so it was so thoughtful. I mean, there's so many stories in this book of people who thoughtfully make our lives better. They thoughtfully make our lives frictionless. They thoughtfully give us back time. Because if you had to go to, you know, the, the, the cable guy and the, you know, phone guy and the con ed or whatever, whatever the, you know, the uh, heating company is in your area. I mean, that, that takes weeks, you know, and, and, and to create a platform. Yeah. Where, where human beings can do that effortlessly and then actually move on and live their lives is extraordinary to me. Um, give me an example of someone else who you talk to that really, I mean, because there's so many, I mean, I could just kind of go through here. And, and so people should know just for, in terms of ease of reading, they're all broken up into nice, easy sound bite, you know, yeah. kinds yeah. of sections. So you can go through and I mean, there's instant pot and, you know, Ryan oh, Simonetti, pot, yeah. and, you know, convene and yeah, um, convene is great. I mean, even let's just think about Halo Top. So Justin Wolverton, who started Halo Top. I mean, I mean, these are people that are that are doing things that they're passionate about. Like he was a corporate lawyer and started making ice cream at home. And what he realized is there was a lot of friction for people that 
wanted to what he calls volume eaters. So not people that have a small bowl, but tub eaters, right? Because there's a, you know, he's got a, he's got a cohort of people that love to sit down and not eat a bowl of ice cream. They want to eat the pint. And so what he wanted to do was figure out how to frictionally, like literally frictionlessly deliver that experience to them in a calorie count that was okay. And that taste, you know, the taste was amazing. And he devoted his life to, to that. And listen, you know, for me, this is as much a celebration as of people who, who give over to their passions and figure out how to deliver it to people, how to deliver their dreams to people in a way that is frictionless um, as it is to, you know, to break down business. Like I think about um, Eric and Walla, the, the CEO of Capsule. I mean, he was standing in line in New York City waiting to get a Z-Pack because he was really sick. And by the time he got to the front, you know, by the time he'd, he'd waited in line for the whatever it was, hour and a half to get to the front of the line at the Dwayne Reed actually on, on, on Broadway, they didn't have any Z-Packs left. And he was sick. And he was like, this is insane. And so he started Capsule and Capsule, um, I, I mean, you know, they, they, New York was their beta, but you know, they have pharmacists online, you can register everything there and the, and, the, and, the, and the prescription gets delivered directly to your home. And if you're somebody who has diabetes or some other chronic um, illness where you need it on an on a ongoing basis, you know, you're never going to go to the pharmacy and not have your insulin. It's going to be delivered to you exactly when you need it every month so that you can stay on top of it, you can stay healthy, you don't have to worry about it. It doesn't become another thing you have to take care of another piece of your time real estate and that's like a beautiful thing to me it is yeah. now almost all of these are examples of new businesses that popped up to disrupt existing models mm -hmm. but it strikes me that if somebody wanted to read this book as a how do i assess my own business mm -hmm. there's an opportunity to look at your own business and say where's the friction how do i remove it so let's take the model and apply it if you were to let, let's say somebody called you up and said, Christiane, we want you to come in, look at our business, identify where the friction is. Yep. And so your next, uh, your next business is you're a consultant now. Okay? Yep. So we're yep. going to call you in. Okay. How do you identify the friction in an existing business so you don't get disrupted by somebody? Okay. Well, this is, this is, you know, this gets, and also this is the competitive advantage, right? I mean, th yep. this is, I'm, I'm handing you, I hope I'm helping you help yourself compete against your uh, against your your competitors um that was not very eloquent but anyway um you know because i think that if you look at your business from this perspective it's going to make sense obviously we're going to start with the digital part of your business um because that's where you know the difference between real friction and no friction is and so to the extent you know we'll, we'll break it down and we'll look at how are you speaking to people how are you getting your product to people regardless if it's a service or a product or you know insurance or banking how are you how are you communicating with people where are your points of friction like let's identify those let's look at the best people in your industry who have figured this out with no friction how can you how can you start to compete with them um, digitally, right? And then I think it, that 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 goes all the way back into your into your retail model, right? Because if you think about the inventoryless model or these smaller footprint stores where you have endless aisles online, how do you take the friction out of the in-store experience? How do you have them all work really flawlessly together so that the consumer has a a is inspired, b has an incredible experience, and c spends their wallet share with you instead of your competitor. And I think that that's how I, it's like a, it's like a 360 thing. I want to talk about scale because that's, that's the place where very, a lot of entrepreneurial businesses bump up, up against. And, and you've addressed that in here. You talked about scale as one of the issues. Talk about the inside and what you're doing now in terms of scaling that so that it, it becomes not just a, a, you know, a niche business. And obviously you're going to have a cohort that, you know, that you're, you're going to address. But at some point, um, I think you, you, I sense here that you would like to be a unicorn. You'd like to be like one of those, those billion dollar valuation companies. Yes, yes. That, that requires scale, so. It requires scale. So here's another, I'm gonna go back to Neeraj. I mean, I hope he's, if he sees this podcast, he's gonna think I'm crazy, but um, Neeraj, um, 
taught me something really fundamental. And that's about total addressable market, right? The, the, the size of the market you can address. And so when he bought Dwell Studio, he has like a, he has like, you know, he's, he's like the king of data. He has this, this, um, uh, this graph on his phone <laughs> that talks about income and the amount of, of homes you can serve in the United States, right? And so and like, you know, average price point. And so we were able to calculate very quickly that my Dwell Studio line was, uh, was, was pricey um, and that there were probably 4 million homes in my total addressable market. So when you think about scale, I'm hitting that, the, I'm hitting the, the, the sort of scale, ceiling of my scale very early on because in that addressable market, I'm also competing with some very large companies, right? I'm a little, I'm a, you know, a, a teeny tiny entrepreneur really. And the only reason we could compete was because of design, right? And that, that in our world, that, that is also currency. Not only is it frictionless, but also execution. But we could only compete to a certain, you know, a certain extent. I mean, Neeraj has it figured out. So he he can probably, you know, his total addressable market is almost every home in the U.S. And he also loves his customer, right? So he's bringing a really beautiful uh, customer experience, regardless if you're shopping at Paragold or if you're shopping at Wayfair on the seventy percent off day. I mean, it's still it, it's it's still coming from the same genesis, right? And so I, I never really thought about total addressable market, but this time I sure did. Um, and so I looked at all of my, you know, I looked at my supply chain from, from Dwell Studio and my supply chain from Wayfair. And I was like, how can we bring this incredible experience to as many people as possible? Because I will tell you this other thing. When I, when I was at Dwell Studio and we went into Target in 2007, I got so many Facebook emails, texts, everything from my consumer saying, Christiane, thank you. We've loved your brand for so long. It was too expensive. And now we can walk into Target and we can get all of the things we wanted for our babies or our homes or whatever, our bathrooms. And we just want to thank you for listening. And I've always, like that was, that was one of the greatest um, business moments of my life because everybody wants good design. Everybody wants a beautiful home. Everybody should have it. Um, and, and Neeraj taught me that it was possible. So how does that apply to the inside? What is your total addressable market for the inside? So we, so I very thoughtfully, we very thoughtfully sort of targeted the price somewhere between, you know, the top of Ikea and, and the middle of, of, of some of the, like West Elm, CB2, um, you know, these are our competitors. And so, and so, I would say that the my total addressable market is probably four times, five times the size this time as it was last time. I mean, look, I, I would love to be able to, I would love to be able to do IKEA. That, that's just a whole other, that's a whole other supply chain something that, you know, maybe we'll get there. Hopefully, you know, fingers crossed. But um, we look at it as wanting to really fundamentally wanting to bring beautiful design to people that they choose to to make their to make their lives better because you know, we're also all refocusing on our homes, right? I mean, we've spent nine, 10 weeks at home realizing like, what do I like? What do I don't like? And I think the most important question is, how does my home make me feel? And we want to give people the tools to feel really, really profoundly good at home. So actually you raise an interesting point. Um, you were wrapping up the book at the end of 2019 so much has changed just in the last you know 60 to 90 days are there some things that you would like add to the book or some addendums that based on what's going on right now that would offer some fresh insights or well, yeah i mean I, I i'm in the middle of writing an uh an op-ed um i went back and i interviewed five or six of the founders in the book because you know uh, unsurprisingly, the people that were digital first and frictionless and bringing people things they need during this particular time period, their businesses have flourished. I mean, off the charts. So one of, the, one of my favorite quotes is from Arnaud Paz, who's the CEO of Pros, um, the, the hair care, um, the, the, the personalized hair care line that we cover in the book. He says that he has um, had 10 years of adoption in 10 weeks. And the data is there. Yeah, 
the data is there. So, you know, his business was a lot of it was wholesale through salons and, you know, people, um, salons blending their formulas, people blending their formulas. Um, and when people could no longer go into salons to get premium hair care, they jumped onto his site. His subscriptions are up 60%. His traffic, I mean, it's through the roof. And it's because he created a, a situation that spoke to this, the, this new digital consumer, which is everybody. Um, and I mean, f phenomenal. And he, he also you know, knows how to deliver. He knows how to, how to formulate for you know, each and every person. He knows how to inspire. And the really interesting thing was, you know, he was at 15% e-commerce, like outside of the wholesale. And now he's at 35 or 40. And they were going to do that between 2020 and 2030. And they did it in 10 weeks. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I mean, I have a million stories like that. Hmm. Well, we'll have to come back a third <laughs> time and talk about those. Okay. Yes. Um, so you're already thinking about the next book. Where do we go from here? I mean, yeah, I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about the next book. I, well, I, I'm thinking about, um, y you know, to me, it's structurally, what does this mean, right? And so part of the reason that I went down this road was because I'm a mom of two kids and I was thinking about college and career and what's going to make them, you know, fulfilled as human beings. And I, you know, when we start, we start to, when you start to parse apart that data, I mean, in their Gen Z, 72 or 75% of people want to start their own businesses. Um, and they want to make a difference and they want them to be sustainable and, you know, they want them to be equitable, you know? Um, and so, and so what does that mean for my children? And I, that's why I started to speak to some of the university professors and Patty Green at 10,000 women, because I think that, you know, it, it's what sets us apart now, but I also think it's really going to be what sets us apart in the future. And so what I learned is that, you know, 60% of the jobs that our kids will have don't even exist yet. Like, just think about social media coordinator. Okay, that, that, wasn't a job, that wasn't a job five years ago. And you know what? Now it's a really important job for every single one of these businesses. So I'm trying to think about what does a frictionless future look for my children? And I probably spend some time there in my next book. I really want to understand what the future of everything for them is going to mean. I, I sense a title, the future of everything. The future of everything, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for taking the time today. I really enjoyed reading the book. I would Glad. highly recommend it again, frictionless. Well, it's also, you know what? It's, it's, a, it's a love letter to our industry. So, I mean, they're doing it beautifully. They never stop doing it. Um, and I just want to give them credit. Well, it's an industry that certainly is worth a love letter. Thank you, Christine, for, for taking okay. the time. Thanks, Bill. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.